It blessed us so last weekend, I must say, when we listened to Charles' um, uh, word of Church Arise the Week, and we realized that he also spoke about Psalm 23. I mean, how is the Lord? How is the Lord? It just um, stirs our faith because we know we are truly hearing his voice. We are like the sheep being led by him to hear from him. And like the word says in Hebrews 4.4, 4, it says there is but one spirit and one body. And there is one hope pertaining to our calling. And this morning we're going to talk a little bit about the calling again. And God being co-labors with the Lord and building with the Lord and being an instrument for the Lord. But it is such a blessing when we know that we hear him. Like last week when we were in sync in terms of Psalm 23. And John 10.4 talks about the sheep and the shepherd as well. It's like Valtis said last week, there's two, over 200 scriptures that refers to the shepherd and the sheep. But in John 10.4, it says, He walk on before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And um, I just want to encourage us all this morning to heed to his voice. And to follow him and to know that it is, we are sure that we can follow his, him. And he walked before us. And I know some of us are facing very uncertain times. I know that some of us are going through deep hardships. But he walks before us. And I know some of us are dealing with deep things in our life and difficult things. And also circumstances that rises against us. And we are unsure, but keep on following because he goes before us. And he is our peace. And he is our place of safety. And it doesn't matter how dark it gets, he walks before us. It doesn't matter how high the mountain is, he walks before us. It doesn't mean how impossible it seems what needs to be conquered, he walks before us. And so I want to encourage us this morning to know that we just keep on following. Amen? We just keep on following in the footsteps that is before us. He is the door. Now, on Friday evening, I felt, Yo, we must have a door frame in church. So we found Lucas. We said, said it's yesterday morning. We said, Lucas, please, magic, door frame. One time door frame, please. So let's just give Lucas a hand because, yo. But he is the door. He is the door. He refers to, we are referred to John 10, 9 that says, I am the door. Anyone who enters in through me will be saved, will live, and will come in and go out freely and find pasture. See, the thing is, we only find life, true life, through the door. We only find pasture through the door. There's no other way we have to enter through the sheepfold. And then is when we will discover life. And we will find pasture. And we just keep on following the footsteps that is in front of us. I love this time of the year. I really do. I love every August and September. It's, it's um, so significant to me always in the spirit. Because eight, like you know, is uh, resurrection life and is new beginning. And always God starts to stir in me what's up for the ne next year. So for me, always my year starts in September, right? I'm hearing from the Lord in August and September is actually my January. And so I'm always so expectant and, and, and waiting on the Lord to hear from him in August. And um, Anlia this week got so excited. She is a child of nature also, but she came to show me by the hand. I was behind my PC and working, and then she would come and take me by the hand. She said, Mom, come and look. Look at the blossoms. Look at the tree budding. And I had to go and stand on her balcony and appreciate nature with her. And she was talking about everything that's coming awake and how the birds are coming. And she actually uh, picked some of the blossoms for us to put in our bath. We had to bath in blossoms this week. <laughs> but it's that awakening that is happening that always stirs me. And it always reminds me of Jeremiah's scripture. Maybe, maybe Albert, if we've got it, we can put it up on the screen. Um, Jeremiah 1. It says, let's read from verse 10, I think it is, let me see, yes, 
from verse 10. See, I have this day appointed you to oversight of the nations and of the kingdoms, to root out and pull down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build and to plant. Say build and plant. Build and plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch or shoot of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you've seen well, for I'm alert and active and watching over my word to perform it. You see, he is the one who gives the word. He is the one who gives the word. He is the spirit of prophecy, but he is the promise keeper. And he is the one who fulfills his word and his promises, right? And then we can testify. And like this almond blossom and almond shoot speaks about the new, about the new season coming, about the new thing that God is making. It says that I am alert and active. And just as the Lord is alert and active over his word, my spirit is also alert and active to receive from the Lord. Lord, what are you up to? What are we doing next? What is the next new thing that we are doing with you, right? We are alert and we are active about what he says. And some of us are late bloomers because, you know, the almond blossom in late winter. And some of us come into our calling rather late. I mean, I was one of them. When I was about to turn 40 years, I had this reflection of my life. And I then said, it's the first half of my life. Now I'm nearly 50. I'm like, no, that's the first half of my life. But I reflected on my life and I could almost like tick all the boxes. Happily married, wonderful children, beautiful house, great career, provision, cars, Boats, whatever. And I ticked all the boxes. It was like the the white picket fence dream, you know. I thought I lived the life. And yet, there was something that was missing in my life. And when when I prayed to the Lord, he showed me an empty jar. He showed me an empty jar. And it was hard for me to see. And I said, no, Lord, and it reminded me of that scripture that says, don't gather what is treasures of the earth, what moth and worms can destroy and things, thieves can steal. And I said, but surely there must be one thing in heaven, Lord. Surely I don't have an empty jar in heaven. And there was just silence. And then I said, okay, Lord, I get it. But then let us make the second half count. And it is still my prayer. Let us make it count, right? Work, live a life worthy of our calling. And some of us are late bloomers, but it's never too late. It's never too late to be instrument in the hand of the Lord. We've just had testimonies of how God brings us back from death to life because there's still a work at hand. Where God grants us one evening because there is a work at hand. Where he grants us one day that we can sow into children's lives and they come to the kingdom. And that is his working, right? And we get to be part of that. And so last week, Vilti did say in the, in, the, in the sermon, he said it was the 7th of the 8th. It's a perfect day to have a new beginning. Now, if that was a perfect today, it's a double perfect day to have a beginning, good beginning because it is the 14th. But it blessed me when I wanted to look up, just reflect again on the, on the deeper meaning of the numbers. I didn't know there was actually two scriptures in Bible that combines a 7 and an 8. Um, and you get the reference of the 7 and the 8 in one verse. And so I was just, it was just interesting for me, so I looked it up, and I'm going to share it with you. Um, because last week was the 7th of the 8th, and it means actually, prophetically, it means more than enough. So I'm going to read the scriptures for you. The one is from Micah 5. Micah 5. Oh my goodness. There we go. Micah 5. I'm reading from verse 4. It says, And he, that is now where Christ was prophesied, and he shall stand 
He will be victorious, right? He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for then shall he be great even to the ends of the earth. And this one shall be our peace. When the Assyrians come into the land and treads upon our soil and in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes amongst them. Now it is more than enough, the meaning of it, because God, you will see there, Jesus don't, don't feed us only bread and what to eat and what to drink and what to dress, but he feeds us here, it says, with the strength of the Lord. He feeds us with more than the strength of the Lord. He feeds us with the majesty of the name of the Lord. So when we stand with him, he feeds us with what is of glory of him that we would conquer in his name. And what he says is that we shall dwell secure because he always goes ahead of us. He always is in front of us. And what he also says is when the Assyrian comes, when evil comes, when difficulty comes, it says it is on our soil. So it is territory that doesn't rightfully belong to the enemy. It belongs to the king, right? It's our swell. It is our palaces. He says, I will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes. The Lord, I believe, in this season is raising up priests, shepherds, kings, young young kings to come through in the kingdom. And those of us that's already standing in the front line, he is propelling to new territories. And I believe it's almost like the change of God where the others are raised up to come into position. And for us that's already in position, we are enlarging, we are increasing, we are going to new territories. What the Lord, the other scripture is interesting is also in Ecclesiastes. How do you say that? Yes, Ecclesiastes. Um, it is 11, 1 and 2. Let's, let's just quickly read that. It's in the context of sowing, which is interesting. Because it says in Ecclesiastes 11, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, yes, even divide it into eight. For you know not what evil may come upon the earth. But this thing is, we've got our seed in the ground. And when evil comes, God is raising up shepherds and young kings against that evil. And we have our seed in the ground. And then it says in verse 4, He who observes the wind and waits for all the conditions to be favorable will not sow. And he, will not, he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you know not what is the way of the wind. And how the spirit comes to the bones of the womb of a pregnant woman. Even so you do not know the work of God who does all. On the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening, withhold not your hands, for you do not know which shall prosper, whether this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So, we need to sow abroad. We need to scatter wide. We need to sow. And when evil comes, God raises us to fight whatever is evil, to, to get back what belongs to him. Right? And I believe that God is raising us up over this time. And there is a propelling forward. Just, and I can say to you honestly, as, as being appointed as pastors over this congregation and also, also um, all the leadership of, of um, Church Horizon, Church Connect, we can really honestly stand here and say for you that our seed is in the ground. Our seed, we are faithful towards the Lord about acknowledging him of his provision. And it is, it is good to know that because when you know that there's also a security, there is a boldness in our faith, right? To know that, yes, we can stand in the blessing of the harvest. Yes, we can stand in the expectation of the harvest. And we can come boldly and say to the Lord, Lord, let's build and let's establish what is of you. Thank you, Lord, that therefore we can fix our eyes on you. And like this verse says, we do not know the work of the Lord, but he does it all. He does it all. And we are just finding our rhythm with him through it. 
says in 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd is revealed, you will have the conqueror's crown of glory. And so our work is to reveal Christ to others. Our blessing is for Christ to reveal himself to us and to receive that. Now, last week I asked Wilty to just put the painting here in front of the pulpit for us because last week Lynn visited our church. Now, for those of you that might not know, Lynn is the lady who prophetically um, painted all the prophetic art in church. Um, she's a prophetic voice and uh, she's dearly loved by us. And you know, God reveals through his prophets and when, when they speak, we need to heed our ears to what the Lord is saying. And when we had conversation with Lynch, she said she is experiencing in the spirit that there is an untethering in the spirit. Now, I didn't know what untethering means, so I had to look it up this week. What does it mean? She actually used it in the context of a hot air balloon. Now, that got my ear, I get my ear spits a bit, because the Lord has been speaking to me about the hot air balloons. I know we live in an area where we see hot air balloons, but I have seen hot air balloons in crazy, ridiculous places. For me, it's always been a reminder to keep the Lord's promises before us. And yes, I mean, also in very significant times in my own, our own lives, God sent us hot air balloons. So when she, she used the untethering in the context of the hot air balloon, she got my attention. So I looked it up and it means in the Cambridge Dictionary, it says, not physically connected or fastened to something. It's not to be fastened, right? It says in the dictionary, it's like helium, a colorless, colorless inert and odorless gas, which associate most often with balloons that float, float skywards and left untethered. So when Lynn spoke, she said, it's like ropes being loosened from a hot air balloon that wants to go, but can't go. The ropes need to be loosened first so that it can move freely with the wind and freely where it needs to go. Also, an untethered animal, an untethered sheep, for instance, is not tied to anything. The sheep is free to move, like that scripture says, free to move in and out. Free to move, to go freely and find pasture. It is the sheep would then wander untethered in new and in larger territories. And I don't know about you, but we have definitely experienced in our own lives a loosening, a loosening in the spirit, right? Um, to be untethered, not to be forced to be staying in one particular place, to be free to move. And um, the ropes that keeps us is often our own comfort zones. It's often the, the securities we think that should keep us safe. It is sometimes the patterns or the way we do things. Think, but we've always done it this way. Why, why would we now change it? It's the way, the habits, the patterns, the mindsets. And God has been definitely loosening us and also from witness from others around us that has got a close work with, walk with the Lord, that untethering in the spirit so that we can move quicker with him. And... Um, I must say, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Lord will move us, relocate us, I want to say. Reloc it might mean for some of us, he will relocate us because he's moving and he's always increasing and advancing. But it does mean that we are freer to move as the spirit leads new territories, wider horizons that needs to be conquered in his name. And I believe that the Lord is positioning us to scatter us abroad, to scatter us to new places that is unknown to us, right? Whether it is new ventures, new business ground that we are taking in, whether it is um, spiritual realms that we need to enter into, whether it is ground for this valley. You see, for the last um, five years, I want it's not really five years, it's we, we, we uh, inaugurated Church Connect uh, in, in November 2018. So for Church Connect, it's not been a full five years yet. But uh, God is definitely saying to us, we must lift up our heads because a new season is here. And yes, we've been pioneering and Church Arise planted Church Connect 
And the local church is very important to the Lord. It must function properly. It must, that is a, a living organism in the body of Christ. It must function to its full. But it's definitely increasing our boundaries beyond the walls of this church. He's definitely lifting us from local church to city church. He's got the valley in the mind. And he's moving us to get us into place because he's moving us to be in position in this region. And therefore, we need to be prepared because these new mantles coming, these, these old things that we must lay down and new things we must take up and others that the Lord is busy positioning and rising up like we read in that first script, scripture. And we almost have to be at a place where the disciples was when he called. He said, come. And they had to leave what they were busy with. They couldn't go and greet their parents, finish business, change their clothes. They had to just say, Lord, I'm here. I'm ready. And so I'm asking you, are you ready? Are you at that place where you can respond and respond quickly? Because I believe the Lord is really untethering us so that we are ready like the virgins with our lamps, that we can go at his call. And we are going to plant and build, and we always plant and build with the Lord. But this time it's a new season because he's moving, he's always increasing, and we are establishing. And I believe that there is also a more weightiness of the apostolic coming onto our ministries. That the Lord uses us, he sends us out and he uses us where we are. And that it will not be like we advertise on our website, three churches and three ministries. The Lord is using us in ministries that he's busy creating all around us. He's given us a large vision in Kehillah. And it's not even about Kehillah because it's about kingdom. It's about kingdom. It's, it's having a kingdom mindset to understand that every spiritual realm that we conquer with him is ground that we take back that is rightly his. And people will turn to the Lord and recognize that he is God. I will build my church, says the Lord in Matthew 16, 18. And the gates of Hades shall not overpower it and it will not hold against it. The Lord is on advance and the enemy will not hold against it. And I believe just as we saw, I, I said to you two weeks ago in this place, whatever we see here, it's not here, it's what God is doing in the hearts of people. This is just a platform, right? But we had no reference of it five years ago. It didn't exist in our world. Can you imagine what we will say in five years from now? Can you imagine what we will say in 10 years from now? Because God is advancing. And it's not, you know, in the kingdom, it's never one plus one is two. It's exponential growth. And that is where we stand in awe and we say, yeah, God, it could only be you, right? And we acknowledge him to be part of that. And so last week, Lynn gave us a, a word about this painting, but this painting is so special. She was instructed by the Lord to bring it. Now, it is called breakthrough. And you see that breakthrough here, it's not a cracking open and a slowly opening like the blossoms. No, it's like the discovery channel where they show how the blossom open, right? Or it is when, I don't know, in the coves we've got problems with our water so sometimes they wait working on the water and then the pressure builds up in the pipes and if you then open up the water it gushes out right gushes out so it is a breakthrough word like that and what she shared with me was so special because she said that you know she's had an encounter with the lord over 10 years ago and she was waiting for the day to release this word and so it's no light thing. And there, was, there were two uh, motivations behind the painting, and I will share one of them. She said that um, in 2011, she was woken up one night with her right arm shaking under the power and under the unction of the Holy Spirit. 
And as she was stabilizing her, her right arm with her left, she heard three times a voice saying to her, the Cyrus anointing, the Cyrus anointing, the Cyrus anointing. She didn't understand what it means. And then she heard the words, seek ye the kingdom first and all of its benefits. And we know the scripture actually says, seek ye the kingdom and all of his righteousness. But she heard benefits. And in her um, search to understand and make meaning of this encounter, the, the Lord led her to a scripture in Isaiah 45. If you've got your Bibles here, I'm reading from the Amplified. You are welcome to open it up. I'm going to read Isaiah 45 for us. Verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him. And I will unarm and ungird the loins of kings to open doors before him, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you, again, before you, and level mountains to make the crooked path straight. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut asunder the bars of iron. And I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches and of secret places. That you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and of Israel, my chosen, I have called you by name. I have surnamed you, though you have not known me. The scripture is so beautiful in the King James. It's actually got a heading that says, Cyrus, my instrument. Cyrus, my instrument. I, wanna, I want you this morning to put your name in there. Vessel, my instrument. Lara, my instrument. Martin, my instrument. Lauren, my instrument. Janine, my instrument. Because the Lord is calling us as his instruments, Right? And now knowing that, let's read it again. He says, thus says the Lord to my anointed, to my instruments, he says, whose right hand I have held. I'm holding your right hand. I'm holding your right hand. Jesus is the right hand. I'm holding your right hand. To subdue nations, that is to overcome, to rule. To reign, to co-reign, says, and I will unarm and ungird the loins of kings to open doors. In the King James, it actually says double doors. Double doors will be opened, right? So that the gates will not be shut. And we know what God shuts cannot be open. What he opens cannot be shut. And I will go before you. It's not any of our works. It's our ability to follow. It's not of our strain and of our labor. It's our ability to stay in the slipstream of grace. But to beckon and to heed and to obey to the prompting. And then it says, I will be before you and I will level the mountains and I will make the crooked path straight. The battle has always been the Lord's. It's not ours, right? The battle is his, but we get to be part of it. He says... And when we have overcame, he says, I'm going to get you, I'm going to share with you the victory and the spoils. Because he says, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. Come on. But then we need to be willing to go to new territories with the Lord. We need to be untethered, willing to be untethered and willing to be the instrument, Right? And he says, so that you will know that I have called you. He's called us. He's called each one of us to be part of this victory. You were chosen. And then he says, I have surnamed you. You know how beautiful that is? I have surnamed you. In our tradition, when we marry, we, the wife gets the surname of the husband. Now, in biblical covenantal ceremonies, they had what they called an exchange of mantles, like we will receive the, the, the surname of the husband. 
And in the exchange of mantles or ropes or coats, they gave the other person the mantle to say to that person that you are now part. Everything of mine is now yours. That ceremony meet, that exchange of the mantle means I give you my honor and my dignity. It means that I exchange destinies with you. My destiny become your destiny. It means that I exchange my identity and I give you authority. All of my identity, all of my authority, I bestow onto you with that exchange of that mantle. And therefore, when the Lord says, I've surnamed you, he says, all that I am, I give to you. All that I have is now yours. The authority in which I operate, you can operate in. The dignity is yours, right? Says that everything I can do, you can do also. When he surnamed us. And if there's one thing I want you to hear this morning is that you have been surnamed. You have been surnamed by the Lord. And so I really believe that this next season with the awakening of us coming into September. I believe that is a place that God has purposed us to move with him unrestrictedly. To follow him promptly. He's advancing his kingdom. And he's inviting us to plant and to build and to establish with us. As his anointed instruments. And he's giving us the promise that he's opening up the doors. And no man will shut it. Doesn't matter what comes against us. Because if a Syrian comes, if evil comes, our seed is in the ground. And he's raising up shepherds and kings to face that evil. Doesn't matter what comes. In the name of Jesus. But it goes. The Cyrus anointing goes with. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all of his righteousness. It's like my empty jar. All the rest that we're busy with. Leads us to a whole lot of nothingness. It is only his desires. That satisfies. I have received a word from Shonae. I, I really feel I want to, to, to um, share it with you because it so resonated in my spirit and it gave language to what I was experiencing but not really being able to express. And so I'm going to read it for you because we received this word um, the Tuesday before the conference, okay? which is also significant to me. And... It says this, it is a word from Nate and Christy Johnson, a prophetic word, but I'm taking it, I'm taking it in my fiber because it says, I'm establishing you, says the Lord. I'm establishing you. I am establishing you. I am taking your feet and I'm planting them firmly and deeply. I'm strengthening you. I'm giving you the land that I promise that I will give you. I will move suddenly and quickly to get you where you need to be and you will have my rest. Just moments ago, just moments ago, everything that I said I would give to you was out of reach. Just moments ago, there were a door that it looked that there was nothing behind the door on the other side. But now you are stepping through the door. And this morning we're stepping through the door. And you will see what I've been building for you. You will see what I've been orchestrating for you. That you did not even know what I was orchestrating. And you did not see what I've been building. And you had no clue of. It's been a season that you felt like you were falling into despair. And into the depths of darkness. But you will soon see what I was building for you. I was establishing you and getting you ready to step into your promised land. But I know it looked like you would never reach it. And it looked like you would never get on the other side. But you will soon see. That I'm leading you through, holding your hand, and making sure you don't miss it. You will see that I've been freeing your feet from every trap, loosening your hand from the basket, untethering you, and removing every yoke from your shoulders. His yoke is easy. 
This joke is light. Yes, I'm establishing, I'm giving you the land that is attached to your new assignment. And you will step in the season of building. That's why I asked Peter to bring a trough this morning. We are stepping into our seasons of building. You had to surrender your plans, your old assignments. You have to surrender everything that you've been birthing and everything you were building. And you would have to burn the old oxen and remove old mantles from your shoulders. And let everything in your hands drop. But now I'm giving you your assignment that it is, is attached to the land. I'm giving you now, says the Lord, that I've been storing up for you for years. I'm deviating. What eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, what's not come up in your heart. You have no reference point of what the Lord has prepared. And keep ready for a time such as this. What I have been storing up for you for years, and you will begin to see what I've been storing, is when, when you see when I have, what I've been storing, you will start to experience the restoring. I will re restore every single thing that was lost. Every single thing that was broken. Everything that was torn apart in this season, it will come back with interest. Soon you will see that your season of the hardest ground Becomes the place of your most fruitful outpouring of my spirit. Soon you will see that the place of your greatest trial and your greatest assassination attempt. Becomes the very location that I pour out my spirit without measure. Can't you see that all along I've been preparing you? I've been preparing you to birth a new movement. Say new movement. New movement. The winds are stirring. I've been shaking you upside down and inside out, but now get ready. What's been, because you will see what's been inside of you, what I've been depositing inside of you. Get ready to see the fullness of the mantle upon your life. Get ready to see fresh oil and fresh anointing that I've been depositing onto you. Let us say amen. Amen. Let it be to us according to this word and we take it and we take it and we are building with Christ and so I believe this morning I believe this morning that a recruitment letter is out in the spirit the Lord is recruiting for master builders in his kingdom he's recruiting afresh for new instruments he's recruiting for us to build and to plant and to establish with him I'm going to go quickly in this last part because I just want to reiterate that it is he that is building and we need to build with him. We can't go in our own wisdom. We have to daily ask the Lord to help us to build, co-build with him, to be master builders. In Hebrews 3, um, maybe we've got it and maybe we can put it up, but I will go quickly through the verses. But in Hebrews 3, it says, So then, brethren, consecrate, set apart for God, who share in heavenly calling. Consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest, who we confess as ours when we embrace the Christian faith. See how faithful he is and was to him who appointed him as the apostle and the high priest. As Moses was also f uh, faithful in the whole house of the Lord, yet Jesus has been considered worthy much greater honor and glory than Moses. Just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself, for of course, every house is built and furnished by someone. And we are those someones. We are the someones. And then it says, but the builder of all things and the furnisher of the entire equipment of all things is God. Amen. Amen. Unless God builds the house, Psalm 127, we build in vain. You know, that Psalm is interesting for me because he also goes on and he says, you labor for nothing. You will achieve nothing. The Lord gives it to his beloved in their sleep. He gives us rest. It's not, you see, the thing is, we sometimes confuse rest with laziness and um, being idle. That's not it. 
It's just there's no strain. There's no sweat. There's an ease because his yoke is easy. And what is interesting for me, he links that building in that in Psalm to children. He says, blessed is the man who got children, you know. It says, happy and blessed and fortunate is the man whose quiver is filled with children, right? Because whatever we build with the Lord is generational. Just understand that the Lord is a tri at least a tri generational God. He says, I'm the God of Abram, Isaac, Jacob. When he speaks, he sees some of the three generations. One time, I'm going to share quickly, I laid with Andy on bed and I held her and I prayed over her. She was falling in my arms when she was little. It's such a special, you know, those special moments that you treasure. And I was praying over her. And then all of a sudden, as I was praying in tongues, I experienced how she's growing up in my arms. She's becoming a young lady. And I saw how she's growing to the fullness and the full stature of who God created her to be. And then I came away that my arm or my hands are resting on her womb. And I came away that she will be a mother and she will bear a child as well. And as I laid there and I prayed, God said to me, you're not praying over under you are praying over generations. And he said that I'm the God of generations. And just like you hold a child, you're actually holding generations in your arms. And this is our God. And whatever we build with him will outlast our lifetime. And this is why we need to build well. We need to build with Christ. We cannot build with anything but Christ. He is the cornerstone. And we need to ask him um, for us to build well. Key scripture of today, let's put that one up, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3, we know it, but let's just read it afresh for us, verse 9 to 11, it says, for we are fellow workmen, joint promoters, laborers together, with and for God, you are God's garden. You are the flower, but you're also the seed. You are his vineyard. So you're the vineyard, but you're also the fruit. You are the field under cultivation. So we are still all in process. We are God's building. We are his building, but we are also his builders. According to the grace, the special endowment, what God's bestowed on me like a skillful architect and master builder, I laid the foundation, and now other man is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is not already laid, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. But if anyone builds upon a foundation, whether it is with gold or silver, precious stones, hay, straw, um, hay or straw, the work of each one will become plainly openly known. Shown for what it is, for the day of Christ will disclose and declare it. And because he will reveal it with fire, and the fire will test and critically appraise the character of worth of the work of each person that each person has done. If the work which any person has built on the foundation survives, he will get his reward. So let's build with Christ, let's build with him in mind. And consider him. We need to follow him quickly. And we need to obey promptly. He's ever increasing us. And so I'm encouraging us this morning. To be instruments. And I'm closing with this. To be instruments of righteousness. To be instruments of his mercy and his glory. To be instruments of thanksgiving. And I know that I am so excited about this next season. The winds are turning. And it is, the breakthrough is here. It's coming quickly. We must be ready. And I honor the Lord for this word. Because when we face things that we don't understand, securities that's being moved or shaken or we are being loosened, just know that the Lord is getting you ready to move. Amen. I mean, I'm going to ask um, 
Janine, would you come and just close for us in prayer, and then we're going to go over to the anointing sermon. Lord, I praise and thank you for this beautiful sermon. I thank you, Father, that you have spoken to each one of us. I thank you, Lord, that each of us is anointed and appointed for this new season. Thank you, Father God, that some of that that is a suddenly has been long in the making and long in preparation. I thank you, Father, that we would each walk through this door and new today. You are the door. You are the way, the truth, and the life. I thank you, Father, that we are never alone. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have breathed your life into each one of us, that we are your temple, that we are anointed and appointed for such a time as this. And Father, that our platform and you, your kingdom in us is wherever we are. We touch lives because you in us makes that possible. Thank you, Lord, that you would anoint each one of us today anew, afresh, for this time, for this new season, in you and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen.